The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS licence nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. A Challenger Lifetime Annuity can do more for portfolio outcomes. A combination of income streams, blending a Challenger Lifetime Annuity with other sources of retirement income, such as an account-based pension, means your clients can get the best of both worlds, guaranteed regular income for life, and access to capital as needed. Help more clients do more, live more, create more. Contact your Challenger BDM or visit challenger.com.au forward slash portfolio dash outcomes. For a retirement portfolio that can deliver more, read and consider the Challenger Lifetime Annuity, Liquid Lifetime, PDS and TMD from challenger.com.au. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I have the pleasure this this afternoon of speaking with Stephen Price uh, from Integer Financial Group. Stephen, thank you for for joining me, you're not you're, you're kind of reasonably fresh off the plane from New York, which I'm keen to get into. But uh, thanks for joining me this afternoon for the podcast. That's right. Thanks for having me. I've had my energy drink, so uh, we're, we're good to go. <laughs> we had uh, we we had this scheduled for uh, for before you went away and you got sick. I was then kind of sick whilst whilst you were away, and yeah, booked this into is it not long after you've you've gotten off the plane. So yeah, we'll, we'll touch on that in in a minute. Um, integer. Of, Financial group, your business. Have you owned and operated it for a while? Like, what's the what's the go there? Yeah, just a tick over seven years now. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, owned, operated by myself. Um, yeah, prior to that, I was with um, yeah, a much larger group, uh, DPM Financial Services, or Don't Compare It Made, as they were yep. known at the time. And yeah, like at DPM. Um, I now yeah focus primarily in the medical space. Okay. Yeah. What what uh, was there a particular trigger point for you to do your own thing seven years ago, or just evolve that way? Like what, what a bit of story? I guess I, I didn't want to die wondering. Yeah. Effectively, so yeah, the the time was right. I guess is the yeah. way to put it. Uh, I had yeah, I had a I had a good run at DPM. Yeah. Uh, I only have good things to say about the guys there. I was still in contact with a lot of the advisors there. I think they're, uh, I think they're key listeners uh, and uh, members of the ensemble audience. So yeah, definitely not going to uh, say anything bad about them, especially if they're listening. But um, no, they're yeah, good, good bunch of guys there. I guess it gets to a point where you, um, yeah, you get to a certain age and uh, a certain, you know, what is it, the fork in the road. A new career, and you're sort of think, well, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna go and do it, now's the time. Yep. Uh, otherwise, it won't happen. And has it been has it been terribly different? Not kind of looking back on the seven years, has it been terribly different to to what you thought it might have been? Yeah, good question. I, I think it's um, I think initially is it's like this idea, and then you have that you know it's almost like that imposter syndrome kind of thing that's sort of you're yeah, sitting there in the background and then you surprise yourself by the fact that it you know oh it's working yeah um and then so it goes from being an idea to oh okay yeah so it's a legitimate business and it, it's working and um yeah then you yeah i guess have to change the mindset well, i know i did with myself yeah. um and so, yeah, yeah. After the first couple of years, yeah, I think I sort of kicked into gear mm. a bit and sort of started treating it a bit differently, as opposed to, oh, this is an idea. Let's see how it goes. Versus, no, this is this is working now. Um, there was no reason why this wasn't going to work. Um, but yeah, that that sort of that you know, I don't know the self belief kicks in, um, and you try and you know, shift away from that imposter syndrome and, uh, you know, start growing and thing. I reckon that's a, that's a pretty common story if I think of people that I've spoken to. You're going to have this 
this period of time where you, you know, you're forking the road, as you're referred to it as, go and do your own thing. There's this period of time where I'm sure you've got this idea in your head to say, well, if this doesn't work out, I can go back and be an employed advisor somewhere else. You know, that that's okay. But then you see six months in and 12 months in and two years in, you're like, this is, actually, this is all right. I don't, I can't see myself that I need to go back there. And yeah, you said there's a bit of a mindset change to say, okay, well, now I'm, I'm fully into this now rather than hedging your bets a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So you talk about medical, um, you, you mentioned there, you know, primarily in that, in that kind of medical space. Can you talk about the, the type of advice that you're that you're doing? Yeah, so historically it's been very risk focused, hmm. and the the bulk of the business would still fall into that category. Um, you know, primarily because I mean, at the end of the day, even from their intern years, or if it's a dentist, especially, um, you know, there's significant incomes that they're needing to protect straight away, and not that everybody else doesn't work hard during their university courses. Um, but I think in the medical profession, they've worked extremely hard to get to the position where they are. Yeah, you know, even probably from high school, right? They're they're <laughs> they're working a bit hard, they're cramming a bit harder, and so all through the unis, they've worked extremely hard to get to the point where they are. So you know, protecting that income is is crucial, and so that's where I guess that you know the, the financial planning journey starts, and and the view has always been to. Uh, eventually, you know, we'll look at things from a holistic perspective as their careers progress through the training programs and into consultant stage. Yeah, uh, but effectively, every every you know client, every doctor that comes on board, yeah, will be adopting some sort of you know risk framework. But gotcha. and and I'm not certainly not a, not a risk e- expert by any stretch. And I kind of commented before we pressed record to say of all the different elements in the financial advice landscape. That's the one part that I that I enjoy the least. I remember, like in my earlier days, that you get BDMs and things coming into the office and saying, "Oh, if you're a doctor or whatever, there's this you can like get an income protection policy, and then we'll automatically increase it. You do your underwriting now, and it automatically increase over time as their salaries go up." Do those kind of things still exist now, or, or with the changes to income protection from a couple of years ago, did that get get squashed? Yeah, so you still have the yeah. There's still the future increase benefits. Yeah, yeah. The what was re, what was a really good benefit when I was first in the industry um, was there was like the newly qualified professional packages. Yeah, under the like under the agreed value, all that. I mean, they were endorsed, guaranteed agreed value contracts. So, um, I mean, probably some of you all listen as a thinking what are the what I don't even know what those terms are, right? Uh, <laughs> so we could probably do a one oh one course on um guaranteed agreed value and agreed value contracts. Yeah. So th- those were really cool benefits because, you know, they were effectively getting, you know, a hundred percent, if not more, of their income straight off the bat, um, without any financial evidence because the insurers they well they knew the pathway of the duty that they were on. And so they were prepared to Hate that, and so that was that was a great benefit those clients. And then, you know, they really didn't have to do anything um, in terms of from a from an increase to their cover, um, probably until they got a good way down their training program, even to consultant stage. Because with the inflation increases that they were getting on those contracts, they were getting up towards you know fifteen thousand dollars a month. Um, Already, you're like by the time they would finish their training program, and they'd actually only ever taken out done the one application. Yeah. So yeah, it's a little bit different now. Obviously, you've you've got the just the indemnity contracts. So um, yeah, you, you're probably not seeing too much of yeah your your future increased benefits being taken advantage of as previously. But uh, I think you also need to be mindful on you know increasing cover as well. Um, especially probably around um, female clients um, because if they're going on maternity leave as well, just with regards to the definitions, you need to be mindful of that, obviously. Okay. If, um, you don't want them to be covered for something that they're not going to be able to claim on. Yep, got it. And so where do you, like how do, you, how do these clients find you? you got a bit of a niche in that medical space. How do you, how do you, how do you get yeah. in front of them to begin with? A lot of time, uh, a lot of money. 
<laughs> uh, is pen, uh, in a nutshell, I think, yeah, any any firm that's operating in the medical space will attest to the fact that, yeah, it, it takes a, a lot of money. And when I say a lot of money, you, you, you can probably look at doing it a couple of ways. Um, I've grown organically and so I've spent a lot of money in terms of getting in front of doctors yep. um, through various channels. Um, or you can buy a, a book of clients, obviously. Um, however, books of clients of doctors are few and far between. Effectively, they're like unicorns. So if you're looking to get one of those, you're going to pay plenty for it. Right? Yeah, okay. I mean, the, the, the multiple, you know, there was one that came up a couple of years back and I think the multiple was four to five times okay. recurring revenue, whereas what's, what's the average two to three times? Yeah, yeah something like that. So, yeah, so you're sort of paying top dollar for it if you're looking to buy a book, even if you can, if you, if you can even get your hands on one. Yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, that's where, yeah, I guess um, I've spent, yeah, considerable amounts of money in terms of getting in front of them. Uh, is, that, then, is, is that in terms of like you're attending conferences that the doctors are at or like like what are you what are you spending the money on? Yeah, conferences is a big part. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can be looking at just to attend, right? So just to get your three by three meter space at a conference, you're looking at, you know, six to seven, maybe even 8,000 depending on the, the specialty. Oh, so you're taking like a like a, a show stand at, at a conference? Yeah. Ah, yes. oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Not just it's in, not just in the audience talking to people. Yeah, right. Okay. You're well, what? The, and it's only just it's only just in recent times now where you know I'm getting the opportunity to actually speak at, at events because yes. obviously over time you 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 know you, you build your your reputation so to speak. Um, so, but yeah, initial in the initial years, yeah, I'm not even there was no speaking engagements, and that's yeah. And a lot of the, a lot of the events still like you won't you won't get a speaking engagement. You just have to, uh, yeah, you just go and exhibit, and you're you're in there, and you're you know you're competing for time of, yes. with these people against a range of industries um, and. Other people within the industry, so you've got there's some you know there's some pretty big hitters out there in our space that you know still go to conferences and have gone to conferences over the years. I mean, uh, Priority Life, who's you know, what well, owned by Perpetual now, you know I think you know they were you know, David Davidson was one of the ones, and Aaron Zellman back in the day, you know those guys were probably the you know originators of going out and and getting there and getting in front yeah. of doctors through that channel. But, you know, and they did it really well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's where it's a big expense. Yeah. Then you've got to do something at those conferences, right? So you can't just you can't just set up. You can you can just set up a a table and you can give away some water bottles or something like that. But you're not. I mean, you're just not going to generate interest, right? Yeah. So you have to sort of do something, and there's costs on top of that. So you can be looking at you know, you're looking at really like a 10k minimum spend. Um, at these at these events, and mm. you know that's not taking into account your staff, and your time, yes, and flight to a call depending on where these events are. Mm. So, uh, so, what type of things do you do? Like we years ago, we took a stand at uh, when it was my idea to take a stand at the uh, it was like one of the baby baby expos. There was like prams and stuff, and uh, the the best thing that actually came from that Slater and Gordon. When they when they did wills and estates, Slater and Gordon had a stand there too, and they had some people telling these you know these these families uh, well you know soon to be with with young kids that they needed to have wills and stuff, and we were like the roll over trying to do financial planning and insurance. Uh, best thing that came from from us there was actually connected with the Slater and Gordon estates team, and ended up doing a bit of work with them later later down the track. But that, so what do you, like what are you doing at, as at a like other than just giving out water bottles, what are you what are you doing there? And you didn't want to stop by. So I mean, coffee, yeah, coffee carts were were kind of big, yeah, a few years back. So um, you're having a barista there, um, and having you know having a branded coffee cart that was kind of that was you know when I first started that was that was all the rage, right? That was yeah. then that was hugely it was really popular. Um, but then that sort of 
Yeah, that market's sort of saturated. So now, like, if you go to an event now, now you're going to have like oh, it's got a coffee cart. Yeah, it's like four to six, four to six people with a barista there, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah, so I've sort of I've stopped doing that a couple of years back because it was just yeah, you sort of just like just another another um, group to you know doing barista coffee. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'll do a few different things. So um, like virtual reality. Mm. It's, is um, pretty popular, yeah. especially um, especially amongst the, the younger demographic, depending on what type of stuff you've got on the virtual yeah. reality. You know, it was, it was pretty interesting. One of the conferences I had, had a setup where um, they were, you know, have people going into like this um, lift and it takes you up a, a you know, high-story building and then um, it opens up and you've got to walk the plank, right? Oh. This fear of... This fear, fear of heights thing, and um, yeah, you, I mean, you know, you've got a virtual reality set on, but at the same time, like you're you're in there, like you, you're in this in this place, and I mean, I couldn't even do it. I have a fear of heights, so I, I couldn't even I couldn't even walk out on the plank. Like first time, I couldn't do it, and then then the second time I did it, I was walking out on the plank. My legs were full on shaking. Oh, I'm and shaking. Yes, I talk. I'm guys like holding, like holding, you guys like holding on to me. And yeah, legit, like we had sort of people coming up and they were literally almost falling over. So you had to hold their arms as they're walking. And so naturally, so as you're doing that, then like it's on the TV. So you've got a massive TV um, for people to watch what, so they can see what you're seeing in this virtual reality setting. And so naturally, a crowd sort of gathers around um, and they're sort of, you know, watching and, and laughing naturally to what's going on. So, Obviously, then that gives you the opportunity to have a chat to people while they're waiting for the going. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you've got some of the younger crew that are used to, you know, they've obviously gone and done virtual reality. And, you know, there's a bunch of younger registrars at an event and they're like, oh, have you got any zombie stuff? <laughs> like the guy. And so he's like, oh, I don't with me, but I can bring it in tomorrow. And so then he brought in this separate headset. And so I had that. I had the fear of heights thing going in one section and then all of a sudden there's these junior doctors that have got these headsets on and they're walking around killing zombies, right? Well, everywhere, all these other doctors are sitting there having their coffees and stuff like that in the break and you just got these guys are like walking around as if they're, you know, yeah. in a complete other planet. So that's the sort of stuff that I think, you know, works well because it's, it's a little bit different. You get much work from that one with the, with the virtual reality? Yeah, so well, it's a good question, right? So, and I think if you've got listeners out there that are looking to, that are just sort of starting out, um, that's not necessarily what you would want to do in terms of if, you know, let's say you've got people who are going to a conference, whether it's a medical conference or whether it's an engineering conference or legal conference. Yeah, you want to probably, you're obviously wanted to do more of a data gathering exercise to get more, you know, more details to, you know, Central people to work with, so yeah. you're probably better off going down that coffee car type of scenario because at the end of the day, everybody's drinking coffee, yeah. right? Um, whereas for me now, I am probably um, having things on my exhibit that are more targeted to certain demographic, which are, and yeah, so you're not getting the volume of people coming up, but I'm getting the people who are coming up that I'm probably. Yeah, um, more and you know potentially more uncommon with they're better fit, better fit for you, aren't they? Correct, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Now you you're kind of on the on the same theme of events and so forth. Who you touched on at the start? You've just come back from America, and so yeah, I asked you was that kind of holiday or, or, or work related? What what was what was going on over there? Uh, so the American Psychiatric Association had their big annual conference on uh, in in New York this year, um, and I do quite a bit with the College of Psychiatrists and I met the CEO of the American Association when I was in Perth last year yeah. and he suggested that I come along. Mm. Uh, I think he wanted me to exhibit, obviously. He was just you know, to sell, sell the conference to me. Um, but I thought, look, I thought, oh, yeah, it'd be pretty cool. I haven't been to New York since I was there. I think last time I was in New York was for the millennium, actually, in 99, 2000, I was in Times Square. Yeah. The world was going to end. Um, so I thought it would be pretty cool to go back. And I remember post that conference having a chat to some of my clients and saying, oh, are you going to New York for the APA? 
because they go over there just to get exposure to what's happening in different parts of the world. Ooh. And some of them were like, oh, yeah, we're thinking about it, um, you know, touch base towards the end of the year. And then one of my clients, um, the beginning of this year, messaged me and said, oh, are you still going over to New York for the APA? And I said, oh, I don't know, I'm thinking about it. And then literally within 24, 48 hours, another two clients of mine said, oh, are you still looking to go over to APA? I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> they all got together and they're trying to pressure me into doing something. So I was like, all right, um, <clears throat> let's do it. You know, So I rustled up a few clients and said, look, let's do something. I was looking at what's going on and yeah, baseball season's on. And I said, well, yeah, um, let's go to a Yankees game. Yeah. Yeah, it would be a pretty cool experience. So, yeah, do you want to have a chat to a few of your colleagues, um, see who's going over? And, yeah, all of a sudden, you know, there's 20, 25 of us at a Yankees game in New York, right? Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, it was a pretty amazing experience. Yeah. Um, and I think so that's really where it's at. It's a case of trying to just, yeah, create uh, a memorable experience mm. uh, and – yeah, I guess that that's the sort of forms of form of marketing. It is absolutely that, that I that I do, and um, you know I think look the majority of my advisors out there provide good advice, and I don't profess to sort of do anything you know necessarily different or, or better than anybody else. Mm. Uh, it's a case of um, you know these types of experiences, though that yeah I'm just in a fortunate position to be able to do them, and you know my clients are ready and willing to. Jump, you know, jump on a plane and go to a Yankees game when they're um, going to a conference. So it all it all just comes together nicely. Yeah. So did you did you attend the conference at all, or did you, did you have a stand there or anything? You no. Did, so I didn't no. have a stand. I didn't have a stand there because from a you know from a cost perspective, based on the numbers, that wouldn't really work out. I mean, and it's obviously we can't provide advice to people. It's not yeah, true. So yeah, 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 yeah. This is a huge conference. I mean, it's a lot bigger than the events here. There, there would be probably about I don't know two hundred Aussies that would go over there. Okay, there was there was a recruitment company from New Zealand that was exhibiting there. Yep. Um, and so I could see potentially like an Australian recruitment company going, but no, I didn't exhibit. I did go to the conference though, mm. just to, to mainly just to walk walk around and check out what was going on. Mm. Um, and look, I was a bit surprised to be honest. Like I was a little. Underwhelmed. I was expecting, you know, because you think America, you think they do everything pretty big. I said, I would have thought, I thought it would be massive and yeah, this big, big spectacle. Yeah. Um, but again, yeah, like, so you had the pharmaceutical companies there and the best that they were, um, the best that they were bringing to the table was, um, Barista Coffee Cart. I was going to say, Coffee Cart. <laughs> coffee Cart. So, um, yeah, which was kind of, um, yeah, quite of amusing for me. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was sort of thinking, oh, maybe I should, maybe I should exhibit, mm. and uh, yeah, get some things happening, happening here. So what's the set? So what's the setup of your business like? It, it, like it's just you? You've got some staff? Like what's the what's the go there? Yeah, I've got staff. So at the moment, I'm the sole advisor. Yeah, um, I've got staff. I've got a fantastic personal assistant, um, and um, yeah, I use a a, a, a business uh, in Australia. Doxa um, Power Planning Group for all my power planning. They're they're a fantastic group. Shout out to Doxa. That's a good plug for them. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's um, yeah that that's sort of international. So it's pretty pretty um, yeah. And, and how do you can you can you talk through can you talk through your process for for a new client? So you've you know, you've done your whole marketing networking thing. Someone that was at the baseball calls you up and say, "Hey, Stephen, you took me to the baseball." I need my insurance sorted out, or, or whatever. However, that conversation goes. Like, where where do you go from there? What are, what are your steps? I'm always keen to learn how how others do their do their part of the process. Yeah. So yeah, again, really good question. You must do this quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, again, that's changed, right? That's evolved significantly from like say what it was when it started seven years ago to now. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if I if I did an event seven years ago. Especially if something like that magnitude in New York, I'd be on the phone, you know, first day back, say, "Hey, what's going? You know, <laughs> can we catch up?" Uh, whereas now, yeah, it's 
probably a lot more chilled. Um, and I'm kind of just letting things just run their natural. Let it come to you. And that's, I guess, where, you know, I guess the, the you know, time and confidence comes in in terms of, well, you, you just know that, um, yeah, you know, things will happen when they need to happen. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, you know, that's where I sort of, um, over time we recognize it's a case of, well, I don't want to be in a position where I'm trying to, I guess, I mean, we're all selling something to some extent, but I don't want to be seen as as selling something. It's more, I'm a service provider there when someone needs that service. Yeah. Uh, so it's more really, well, I guess, they're, yeah, they're contacting me um, as opposed to me contacting them now. And then, yeah, we, we sort of plug them in and you, and you go through the, you know, you go through the process as dictated by legislation. Yeah. Okay. So what do you, like, what do you, you talk me through your financial advice process? Yeah. In terms of doing like when, like from basically when they hit the- Yeah. So someone, someone's called you and said, I need your help. And then you go, okay, all right. What well, like, do you do, are you doing pre-assessments? Are you doing like, hey, you're doing your data gathering? Like, what do you, can you give yeah. some tips there? Yeah. So, I mean, you do your data, you do your data gathering to find out more about it. You're going to the top, what the situation is. I mean, a lot of my clients are very similar. Um, you know, they might be single way of a partner, but um, they're in the early years, so a lot of them won't have kids necessarily. So um, you kind of have a fair idea of where they're going to land. Um, and from like, you know, from an insurance perspective, obviously, yeah, I mean, I'm, I can look at any product in the market, mm. um, but I guess you, you know where they're going to land at the end of the day because at the moment, PBS Mutual, for instance, is, well, as the best definition for income protection um, in the market and it's the most competitive in terms of price. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, you know, we cover our off from a compliance perspective and, you know, we run our comparisons and you, you do all the research, but in the majority of cases, the clients are, are landing you know, from an income protection perspective, they're landing at PPS Mutual. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, they have the specific occupation definition through the age 65 uh, still. And as a medical professional, yeah. that that definition is paramount. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's paramount for a lot of professions, um, but especially for them. I mean, getting back to us and what, you know, said at the beginning of our discussion, I mean, they've worked extremely hard to get to the point where they are now. So it's imperative that they're, you know, they've got the best definition available. Yeah, I suppose that's it. That, that, that just comes. With, yeah, obviously you're talking about you do, you do your research and your cost comparisons across the market and all the rest of it. But, but at the end of the day, when you're working in a niche and all the clients kind of look the same as each other, they're a similar age, they're similar studies, they're doing similar kind of jobs. The advice is also going to be fairly similar, unless there's some, you know, some particularly unique part about their situation the advice and the product and so forth is going to be fairly fairly similar and hence kind of you already know just because of the way the that that insurance market is right now that a particular company has the best definition for these types of clients yeah really i mean the only time you're sort of varying from that is yeah if there's a because you're going to obviously you do your your medical pre-assessment as well which is pretty important these days just because of the cost of advice so if there's a particular, you know, if there's some medical history or there's some family history you know, in the background there, well, that might mean, yeah, you need to look at other options because, yeah, certain insurers have a particular bent towards, you know, you know that type of appetite for that type of risk. Yeah, they yeah, they either do or they don't, don't they? So do, do you find, how are you finding, like, that, that kind of underwriting decision? Like, it seems like, it seems to be, you know, two out of three clients that we're, do it that we're doing that pre-assessment with there's either some there's either a, a kind of a back problem or there's a mental health problem in in two out of three are you are you seeing a similar kind of thing coming through yeah i think anybody over the age of 40 that is saying no to everything is lying <laughs> and i think your underwriters will probably agree with that as well yeah it's definitely tougher to get coverage now than what it was uh, when i first started in the industry mm. that's for sure so, yeah, I mean, it, it's important to sort of, yeah, ask those questions up front as well. So, I mean, not just to I mean, waste our time. I mean, but at the same time, you don't want to waste the client's time yeah. either. Um, and then it just enables you to, you know, speed up the process. If you know that they still can get coverage, you know, know you know where to, you know, where to go. 
Yeah, look, I'm, I'm sure, and many you, you may well be the same. But I'm sure, like you know, back in when I was first started advising, we'd kind of go through the whole process, particularly around the insurance part. We'd go through the whole process of quoting and whatever, and we'd put some advice to someone to say it's cheaper for you to go with this one because of you know one, two, three, and four, or whatever the reason was. But we actually didn't hadn't done any reassessments, underwriting, and then you end up backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards and then you need some new advice because this insurance company puts an exclusion on but this one over here uh, isn't that's it it's so important now to be doing that pre-assessment work yeah i think and i think just as important that you've got to have a relationship with the underwriters yeah is as well which i think that's probably something that yeah, it probably needs to be sort of spoken about a bit more, I guess, with the the you know the young crop of advisors coming through, right? Like, I mean, you have the BDMs talking to you on the investment piece quite a bit, and even you know the insurer to insurers to a lesser extent, but the underwriters are the people that you need to establish relationship with, right? At the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to you know make or break you, yeah. So to speak. And they're they're the ones. Who, I mean, you know, you're not going to get the decisions like we used to back in the day with like bracket creep on occupation rankings and uh, things like that. Um, but, you know, if if you've got a good relationship with someone and, you know, you've got a client that's borderline, you know, that relationship is definitely going to work in yeah. favour, in the client's favour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suppose it's better. that's the benefit of doing insurance work with someone that's, that's doing a lot of it rather than just, the odd bit here and there, uh, because you, you're going to no, you're going to have a, a far better relationship with the underwriters than what than what I for, for sure. And so you can talk through some of these health issues that the client might have and try and get a better outcome for them rather than just the, the default response that you get from the underwriter. Well, we hope so anyway. <laughs> How do you so so that kind of that kind of life journey with these clients you, you're talking about? The, you know they. They tend to be younger when they're coming in, finishing their studies and so forth. There's a bit of insurance work that you're doing with them. Does that then evolve? Does that then 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 kind of expand into into broader, you know, uh, kind of holistic financial advice in time with with some of these clients? Yeah, it's starting to, and I mean, it's going to it's only going to continue as you know as the the clients yeah um or get get older naturally, but yeah, progress through their careers. So you know, the bulk of my clients are. You know, probably in their training program and, and junior consultants. So, okay. um, you know, they'll they'll get well on the way to paying down the debt on their on their properties, and yeah. um, and then yeah, then it's a case of you know we'd be looking to see what they want to do now. Historically, you know, medical professionals are pretty geared towards buying more property, and, yeah, and that's okay. I mean, they get access to leverage effectively that the rest of us mere mortals don't have and do the bank banks love them like the insurance companies love them <laughs> yeah i mean you know they they can buy an investment property with no deposit you know mm-hmm. and no letters mortgage insurance so you know they're at a, a significant competitive advantage um when it comes to, to property so you know if you're taking that into account um then the whole property versus shares you know argument sort of kind of goes out the window when, mm. when you know, the advantages that they have, yeah, no, God. yeah, and, and do, you, do you see the client base kind of aging as as you do, or or do you or do you continuing to, you know, the newer clients are continuing to be the ones that are just kind of wrapping up their studies? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, yeah, I feel like I'm sort of definitely sort of you know going on the journey with with my clients, and I, I know I feel like I'm definitely getting. Oh, I mean, I've got three young kids, so they keep me on my toes. But um, and then when I get the newer clients coming in, and you know, I'm entering in their dates of birth, and you're sort of you're entering in these dates of birth, and you're like, far, it's kind of like far out. Yeah, uh, you mean yeah. someone's born on this side of of two thousand, and they've got yeah. like a, a good job by now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's yeah, um, yeah, it's kind of well, it's like you, know, you can be, you know. Working with a dentist, it's like you know, twenty six years old, and they'll be on, you know, they'll be earning a quarter of a million dollars plus, yeah. and you're kind of sitting there scratching your head, and like oh, I went down the wrong career path, you know, <laughs> twenty years ago. You um, get a bit of that, don't you? Yeah, um, and it's kind of you look at that, and it's like oh well, yeah, I probably won't be, probably won't be there for the whole journey with this client, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, it could be you know six feet under by that stage. But but look, there, you know, I have a good bunch of clients, and um, 
yeah, I'd like to think that yeah, I've been working with them for yeah, a little bit of time yet. Yeah. Good. What's uh, what's next for for you in the business? What do you, you got? Got any 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 plans from here? Um, it's just continuing to evolve. I mean, I, I'm going to have to yeah, I'm going to have to ramp up soon um, in terms of scale with with more staff. Whether that means more advisors or more admin, that's to be worked out in due course. Um, where um, where yeah, we've just opened up effectively a, a mortgage broking um, as well. Yeah, uh, and um, yeah, I've set up a, a new business recently, um, which effectively into Dura is essentially a, a partner of to some extent amongst other other firms that work with medical professionals. So um, yeah, that business is leveraged MD. Um, which is effectively an education and events business that, um, yeah, will work with, you know, not just myself as an advisor, but other financial advisors, accountants, um, you know, medical indemnity companies, um, uh, yeah, medical recruitment companies, um, and, you know, insurers like PPS Mutual that specialize in the medical profession um, with regards to, yeah, um, just getting getting education out to um, the doctors via mm. various channels. Uh, yep. Whether it's just by, you know, by things like LinkedIn or, you know, webinars, podcasts, um, but also the, the live events, which is, you know, where I guess um, I think that's where there's a, um, a market. I think that's what sort of they're crying out for. I don't think there's enough of that these days. I think that's mm. something... I think that's something that the like you know, we as a, the advice community did really well, like years ago when I first yeah. came to the industry. Um, There's in person CPD days. They were so much better than the than the online ones. Yeah, and so that's sort of gone by the wayside. And I think there's the same with you know, and I look at that though know, in the medical community that I think yeah they're crying out for that as well. But I mean, I, look, I think anybody's crying out for it after those COVID lockdowns. Yeah, true. Well, so yeah, uh, so that that's sort of what's yeah, that's that's where things are moving forward. Yeah, interesting. We'll see where the journey goes. Yeah. Well, Stephen, thanks for joining me this afternoon. Appreciate you you coming on. Bit of value there for for others and and the, and the coffee cart, <laughs> the coffee cart at the expo. That's what was missing for us at that baby show. We should have had uh, we should have had a coffee cart a few years back. We were just trying to hand out water bottles. That didn't go so well. That or apple value would have been good at something like that for for the parents. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, Stephen, thank you. Thanks for joining me. Uh, I appreciate it and, and, and good to have a chat. Thanks, James. Appreciate your time.